Today we're talking about Canadian banks. At the end of this video, we are going to see why Canadian banks got cheap on their dividend increase. If you think that double digit increase is cheap, actually. Um, a lot of investors expected more. We're gonna talk about that. We're gonna talk about results. Dividend investors, bonjour. My name is Mike Hiru. I'm the founder of Dividend Stocks Rocks and I am a passionate investor. Most importantly, I love Canadian banks. I've worked in the financial industry for 13 years, working for National Bank all that time, so I know them inside out. Uh, last week, we had the six biggest bank reporting their earnings. I'm not going to cover Canadian Western Bank. Uh, long story short, smaller bank, increase of a dividend of 3%, not exactly in my ballpark. And honestly, it would be my seventh pick. So I don't see any reason why we would this one. Uh, this video is complimentary to uh, the podcast I just did yesterday. So if you want to have like a 35, 40 minutes listen show on what happened for the Canadian banks, go right down below, check out the podcast. We talk about a lot of numbers and a lot about perspective, but today I want to provide you some graph and it's pretty hard to do it on podcast. So let's do this. Um, first, let's take a step back and see what happened over the past few years in terms of total return for Canadian banks. As you can see on this first graph, we have it for year to date. Bank of Montreal has been the star of 2021. We'll see that in the results as well. Um, the most generous in terms of the dividend increase, uh, the one that has performed the best across all segment. And you can see it, total return is also a big winner. Uh, Compared to the rest of the market, uh, the XYU.TO, the um, TSX index ETF, uh, up 25%, all banks did better. So that's quite interesting. If you're looking at beating the market, you can consider Canadian banks. They usually do well. If we go a little bit further, we're going to see that National Bank picked it up over the past three years did very well. Um, overall, banks did well, but actually the market is pretty much in between. So 54% return for the TSX. Uh, we got um, TD, Royal Bank, not too far from it. Also on the other side, uh, Bank of Montreal as well. So pretty much everything, the banks, like you got like National Bank that was way up and then Scotia Bank way down. But overall, they pretty stuck to the market for the past three years. If you move towards the past five years, uh, then you have CIBC and Scotiabank starting to lag. Uh, the market did a little bit better than Scotiabank, but besides that, it's pretty much lagging as well. So Canadian banks are taking some advantage as you go through all time. If you look at the past 10 years now, the picture is really clear. Again, unfortunately, Scotiabank lovers, and I have actually a graph for you about the international market at the end of this video, so make sure that you stick around. Uh, we're gonna discuss about their international exposure and maybe why the comp the, this bank is lagging behind its peers, uh, but it's still doing better in the market, so it's not too bad, and I wanted to have a little bit more perspective and I've put it before the financial crisis. So between January of 2008 and today, which is beginning of December of 2021, at the time of recording this video, you can see that all banks did better than the market, some a lot more. So we have National Bank at the top, but we still have very good performance of TD, uh, Bank of Montreal and Royal Bank, all up more than 300% total return. Uh, long story short, banks are doing well they are well established they have a lot of capital they're generous with their dividend but it's not only a matter of having a good yield it's also a matter of having a good total return so now let's go back to what really happened this quarter so you can see now on this graph how earnings per share increase it was pretty much a party here. Uh, we got like some lagging a little bit with Royal Bank and CIBC up 20% each, but all the others plus 31 for TD, 45 B Scotia Bank, um, 38 for BMO, 61 for National Bank. I mean, long story short, 
we got lots of volumes for loans and we also got a lot of smaller provision for credit losses that was pretty much the story behind a quarter obviously we're going back uh, from 2020 uh, that was a very tough years in terms of provision for credit losses we've discussed that in past videos so all banks they look at their portfolio they see if they have any loans at risk and if they do they will increase their provision for credit losses um, after a while and this affects automatically earnings after a while if they see that oh okay so those guys are actually paying their, their loans what they're going to do is that they are going to reduce the provision for credit losses and eventually it's going to also affect earnings positively uh, now you can see the cet1 um that's a ratio of liquidity according to Basel three. It's a it's um it's it's a world uh, deal where all banks must comply to have at least I think it was like nine percent minimum ratio here for the for the quality of their assets. Uh, you can see banks uh, Canadian banks are doing very well. Uh, a lot of them around twelve thirteen and then TD which is. Uh, major player here, uh, leader in, in terms of um, the quality of their assets. So 15% CET1 ratio, very good. Uh, in terms of buybacks, uh, a lot of buybacks have been announced. So BMO buying back roughly 3.5% of their shares, National Bank at 2% and then Royal Bank at 3.2%. I know there's a lot of critiques, a lot of uh, investors saw that say, yeah, on one side, they're reducing the amount of outstanding shares, which is good for the price, but it's also good for earnings per share. So basically, if you re if they report the same earnings per share next year, well, they will show an increase of 3.5, 2% and 3.2 if they have bought back all those shares remaining. Uh, so it's a natural way to boost your earnings. Um, and at the same time, while well, executives are happy because a lot of their bonus depends on how uh, earnings are growing. So here, uh, little cons, little pros, uh, not too sure if it's going to move the needle moving forward, just telling you that they have a lot of liquidity. The major critique here is usually why would you buy your stock at the highest price possible? Fair enough. All Canadian banks are trading a very high time high price. But when you think about it, we all wish we had purchased those banks in 2013 or 2014. And they were also trading at an all time high back then. So we'll see in five, 10 years how it's going to happen. Um, I try to put all the uh, results in a single graph and single chart. You get it here. Uh, so P and C stands for personal and commercial. Then you have some companies, some banks that have US segment. Some has wealth management so, and then capital markets. And uh, we have National Bank and Scotia Bank that has international. As you can see, Royal Bank is a bit different. They have investors and treasury. Um, results were up 20% in, in there. And then they have insurance at plus five. Uh, big disappointments from that chart. I'd say uh, wealth management from Royal Bank up 2%. That's nothing, especially when you compare it to all the others. So that is one thing that not so very uh, impressed they explain it because expenses were up um, I get that but I mean it's pretty much the same deal for all the other banks so that was not great uh, another one was in capital markets national bank went flat and then TD showed a double digit decline uh, not the best performance here, especially when you compare it to BMO, Royal Bank, and Scotia Bank. And finally, um, CIBC went through their regular uh, provision for credit losses update, and they actually increase their provision for this quarter. So this is why the PNC segment, personal and commercial banking, went up only by one percent compared to all the others that were double digit and actually pretty aggressive number. We're talking like 35, 42, 59 for Scotiabank. Uh, now we have this like 11 in the room. We have 89% increase for net income in the international branches. A lot of people are just like, yeah, woohoo, Scotiabank is killing it. Well, not exactly. So let's 
dig a little bit deeper on this one. That's what I told you at the beginning of the video. Um, I've pulled out the net income for the international branches since 2012. So as you can see, when the market is doing well, when the economy is flourishing, those countries, uh, La Latin American countries, so most of them are either in Central America or in um, South America, they're doing very well. So the business is good, uh, everybody's confident, and you see 90% net income increase over seven years, almost double digit on an analyzed growth rate basis. Amazing, right? Then we got a recession, we got lockdowns, we got all kinds of problems in 2020. So it goes down big time actually. And then it went back up in 2021, but not as fast. So now we're back into... 2017 numbers, uh, bringing the growth uh, over nine years to 49%, 45 uh, annualized growth rate. It's not bad, but you can see that it, it, it adds a little bit more volatility than expected. Sometimes it's not that great and Scotiabank will likely suffer every single time we hit a recession because emerging markets will get it very hard. Uh, over the past few years, as we have seen on the first graph at the beginning of this video, it was not enough to move the needle, even though this segment was growing double digit. Um, actually, if you come compared to National Bank's video from last week. So just go back in the show note to, to watch it right after this one. You'll see that National Bank has plenty of growth vectors like wealth management, capital market, and international banking that actually grew double digit, but we're more talking even like 15% wise growth rate over the past 10 years. Uh, so there are other ways for banks to grow fast, not necessarily just international market and actually it just brought in a little bit more volatility to the basket more than anything else. So something to consider moving forward. Now let's end this video with everything, with the thing that everybody wanted to see, right? Uh, dividend increase. The market was disappointed, investor disappointed, and I'm pretty sure that was all due to financial analysts and newspapers trying to build that hype around those like juicy 30, 40% dividend increase that unfortunately didn't happen. Um, you can see it here on this graph, uh, on this chart. What I like here is that I put the dividend increase and then I put the dividend paid on January 2017 versus the, the dividend that will be paid in 2022 to get a five year increase. Um, on the top of the list, TD, BMO, National Bank. Kind of funny because BMO was one of the less generous before the pandemic, but that 26% increase kind of changed the overall uh, picture over the past five years. So you see how fast one increase can make a big difference when you look at the five-year trend. Um, not too far behind, you got Royal Bank at 7.65, which is still very good, and then lagging CIBC and Scotia Bank. It seems that it's a repetitive narrative that I'm I'm putting here, but you know, it's not that I dislike those banks. It's just that every single metric I look at, they're always last. It's not my fault, right? <laughs> I didn't make up those those numbers. But overall, it was a great quarter for banks. Um, Dividend increase double digit was really good, but where does it put now in terms of payout ratio and future expectations? So what I did is I've looked at the next dividend payment. I multiplied it by four. Chances are the dividend payment in 2022 will be more, it will be higher than that. I expect banks to go back to their regular schedule where they will be increasing their dividend by five to 7% a year. Chances are most of them will offer you a double, um, uh, it will offer you twice um, dividend increases, maybe two, three percent each time to reach that five to seven. Uh, I've looked at the adjusted earnings per share for the full year and I calculated the payout ratio. Um, so right now what we see is Scotiabank again, 
highest payout ratio here, one of the one that was the like the less generous in terms of dividend growth rate, doesn't look that good. I mean, obviously a payout ratio of 51% is not the end of the world. Your dividend is safe, it's gonna keep increasing, but uh, the performance is not that great versus other banks. On the other side of the spectrum, we have BMO and National Bank with very low payout ratio, 39 and 41. Uh, a lot of investors were disappointed by the 23% increase from National Bank. They expected a lot more because they made so much money. Um, fortunately, um, I think that they will be using this money to grow their uh, international and U.S. specialty finance segment. Uh, they've made interesting acquisition with Credigy and ABBA Bank over the past few years. I'm expecting more acquisition on that side. So I'm not very disappointed by the fact that the dividend was not as uh, as generous as we expected. After all, they're still number two in terms of the growth rate over the past five years. So that's more than enough for me. But if you look at the past, um, and I think this is maybe why the hype was there because all analysts calculated the payout ratios and expected to have something maybe more in line between 45 to 50% for all banks. And this is why we expected a little bit more because when you look at this graph where you see um, payout ratios before the pandemic, uh, most of them were around 44, 45%, closer to 50% for some of them. Uh, so this is what was expected. It didn't happen, unfortunately. And I think this is where coming the big disappointment. Now, moving forward, I think you will continue to have a very healthy dividend growth rate, five to 7%, so mid to high single digit. I'm not expecting them to go all in and give you double digit increase next year. Uh, they've played catch up with this recent increase. Now they're pretty much good to go. They still have to pocket some money because the government is after a special tax on banks. So maybe it's going to hurt their earnings. Uh, they're going to see interest rate rises in 2022. So this will help their margin, which is good, but this will also slow down uh, their loans volume. Uh, we had a great year in 2021 because provision for credit losses decreased and at the same time people went into credit like there's no tomorrow. It's not going to be like that every single year. I'm expecting the housing market to cool down because as inflation rises, central bank will want to increase rates. It's a good thing for the long run because it's a healthy decision to make, but over the short period of time, um, the market won't like it bank are going to see a little bit less uh, growth in their um, loan portfolio, but I'm not concerned about default. I'm not concerned about seeing like a bunch of mortgages going sideways, mostly because banks must qualify um, new buyer, new own buyers uh, with their posted five years rate. Uh, so which is a lot higher than what it what they pay right now. So even if a, with a 1% uh, interest rate increase, it's not going to move the needle enough. So it's going to slow down the future growth, but it's not going to put anybody's financial into Joe Party. So this is what happened this quarter. My favorite stocks moving forward are still National Bank, Royal Bank, and TD Bank, but I would add a little stars on the student notebooks for BMO uh, because they did an amazing year, but also must consider that over the past few years, they've kind of like had this habit of having an amazing year or amazing quarter and then failing again to post consistently this kind of growth. Uh, so still right now it has like the student of the year. That's great, but Will it be able to do it again next year? Not convinced. So again, this video uh, was a compliment to a YouTube podcast I recorded with Veronique. If you're not familiar with the YouTube pod, uh, with the uh, with the podcast, go right down below in the note. Check it out. Give me a thumbs up for that video. Keep uh, helping me growing this quarter. I want to also give a special shout out to all the people that answer that ask questions um, on my Twitter account about banks. I've covered them all in the podcast, so that was great episode, great compliment. I hope that you have enjoyed this kind of like new format. But every quarter, I'm keep going to review Canadian banks on this channel as well. If you have any questions about banks, if there's anything that you want me to cover. 
leave a comment below, give me a thumbs up, and until the next video, stay invested.